Hello guys, Winston here. It is a commonly held truth that drilling is not ideal to do on a CNC router, and there are two reasons that are usually given. One is RPM. Routers spin too fast to drill at optimal speeds and feeds. This can lead to reduced tool life and even scorching in your material. Two, drill bits tend to be long and fragile, and at those high RPMs it can be dangerous to have a several inch long drill bit whipping around in a router. I don't think I've used the drilling operation in Fusion 360 more than two or three times in my life, and I've generally recommended boring or contouring over drilling when it comes to making holes. But at the same time, I know there are people out there who aren't afraid to YOLO it on their machines and will use a drilling operation on their CNC routers, usually with regular flat end mills too, and they're still around to tell the tale. It couldn't have gone that badly. So what's the deal? Can you or can you not drill on a CNC router? That is what I wanted to set aside some time for and figure out experimentally. But before we start playing with drilling operations, I do want to acknowledge that the best way to make holes on a CNC router is still boring. And for the uninitiated, a boring toolpath is one that isn't very exciting. Sorry about that, I had to make that joke before anyone else did in the comments. Let's get back on track. Boring operations spiral down to a desired depth with an end mill producing a hole of whatever diameter you want, so long as that hole diameter is larger than whatever your end mill diameter is. I personally like that difference to be at least 10% of the cutter diameter, otherwise your CNC ends up making really skinny spirals all the way down. This is how I create the vast majority of my circular features on the CNC, and the flexibility you get from decoupling the diameter of the hole with the diameter of the cutter is really convenient especially when router collets have a very limited clamping range. So basically, you can only really use 8 inch and quarter inch shank drill bits in a conventional router equipped CNC, unless you want to invest in obscure router collets you'll rarely use, or an ER collet equipped spindle. But from a theoretical perspective, drilling holes does have its advantages. A drilling operation is a purely z-axis toolpath, either plunging straight down to the desired depth or in multiple steps. The roundness of the holes you get from drilling will be as true as your router spins. So, unless you bought a router that moves like a KitchenAid stand mixer, the concentricity and dimensional tolerances should be pretty darn good, much better than a bored or interpolated hole. It should also be faster than boring since you don't need to take a longer spiraling path down. However, conventional wisdom dictates that drilling be done at much lower spindle speeds than routers can manage. Just like with milling, you don't want to be creating dust you want to be making chips. The drill bit needs to be continuously shaving material, not grinding away material by friction. From a sort of kinematic perspective, that requires the plunge feed rate to be strictly proportional to the RPM. For every revolution of the cutter, you need to advance the drill bit enough so that the cutting edge can engage fresh material. The faster your RPM, the faster your plunge feed rate needs to be. But realistically, you have to consider more than that, particularly on a desktop CNC router. It takes force to advance that drill bit into material, RPM alone won't do it. Drilling metals properly requires a lot of force and torque, enough for that drill bit to pierce the material's surface and let the cutting edge at the tip shave off material. If your spindle can't sustain that effort or your CNC can't feed fast enough to stay under that shear front at the tip of the drill, it's going to end up as a short-lived grinder. And if the stakes weren't high enough already, you can build up heat incredibly quickly at router RPMs. Heat means softening of non-ferrous metals, which means gumminess, which will lead to even more friction, and conversely, in ferrous metals, that heat and rubbing of the drill bit against the material can lead to work hardening of the metal. Everything has to go just right for this to work, and you'll likely have to use some sort of cutting fluid to be safe. This is not an area I want to get into just yet. But what about a softer material, like wood or MDF? Those materials will yield easily to a router, and if it gets a little hot, it'll just char or abrade away without melting. Before we run a test though, let me advise against using a normal drill bit in a router. Having a long tool like this that's not designed to take much lateral force whipping around in your relatively low precision router at high RPM is a terrible and dangerous idea. You can reduce that risk by using a short length drill bit and dropping your RPM as low as you can. Even then though, I'd feel a lot better keeping a physical barrier between me and a larger size drill bit and I would seriously avoid doing it on a DeWalt router which can't spin slower than 16,000 RPM. 
Square end mills could work as well, but they really don't do a good job of centering themselves and they can kick on sharp sustained contact with material. And the bigger the end mill, the worse this is. If you plunge too fast or too deep, you can cause the stepper motor to skip. A lead screw or ball screw driven z-axis paired with a split point drill bit is really the best way to go in these cases. Alright, with those recommendations out of the way, here is my test setup. I'm trying out my drilling operations in a wood I despise, oak. Holes will be drilled at the minimum RPM of my router, which is around 10,000, give or take a small margin of error. I'm also skipping the use of a spot drill to start these holes, since this is only wood and my drill bits are fairly stubby. With an eighth inch drill bit, I started at about 20 inches per minute or 2 thou per rev. But with feed rate override, I quickly ended up at 40 inches per minute. There really wasn't a lot of resistance for the spindle using a drill bit this small. Later on, I would increase that limit to 50 inches per minute. I played around with different pecking depths, ranging from 1 to 3 times the diameter of the drill bit. I ended up liking the results with a quarter inch peck depth the best. If you do a lot of shallow pecks, you end up spending more time traversing in and out of the hole and generating heat. If you peck too deep, you start packing the flutes with chips and also generating heat. Even at the 2 times diameter pecking depth sweet spot, drilling never really sounded great as you got to deeper depths. If I kept my holes shallower than half an inch, the result was a lot better. I did also try this with a flat end mill, and although it worked, it really didn't sound great. There was still some vibration happening, and the hole ended up a lot looser. Don't say it. Well. If you look at the anatomy of a drill bit, you'll notice that the lands or the region between the flutes is a lot taller on a regular twist drill. Between that factor and the angle at the tip, a split point drill does a better job of centering itself in a hole. If an end mill starts vibrating or wandering at all, it'll just shave material off the walls. It's designed to cut laterally into material. That's why the walls of the end mill drilled hole were clean and free from any burn marks, but also fractionally wider. Now, stepping up to a quarter inch drill bit was where things started to get sketchy. I tried similar tests, varying the peck depth and speeding up my plunge feed rate to as high as the HDZ would go, and no matter what, I would end up with my oak well done. It was even warm to the touch. This might actually be a perk if you're using a more aromatic and pleasant smelling wood, but honestly, I really don't recommend drilling any holes larger than an eighth of an inch on a CNC router unless you can significantly drop the RPM into the four digit range. 8th inch is right at the cusp of what I would recommend. If you do the math, the surface speed of an 8th inch drill bit is 327 feet per minute, which is not terribly scary. And as you start using smaller and smaller tools, a router's RPM actually starts to become pretty okay. Surface speed decreases with tool diameter, RPM being constant. I think this is where PCB and micro drill bits really shine. They're usually available in 8th inch shank sizes and can drill far deeper than most standard flat end mills for a given diameter. However, unless you have a proper spindle with a real collet system and not a router, you'll want to limit how small a drill size you go down to. My rule of thumb is at least 20 times your runout. So if you have one thou of runout, you shouldn't use any drill bits smaller than 0.02 inches or about half a millimeter. And this guideline is really only valid for softer materials that will yield easily. If you want to drill into a hard plastic or composites or even metal, your spindle runout constraints will have to be even more stringent. So now that we got the boring lecture portion of this video, pun not intended, out of the way, let's look at a project I actually did a few months ago but never got around to making a video for. Two years ago at the Bay Area Maker Fair, I met up with a couple of folks from what was then SNPs, a technology company aiming at improving human-machine interactions using an architecture that was prioritizing privacy. Think offline voice assistant. Developers could build and implement whatever hardware they wanted to that leveraged the voice deciphering capabilities of the SNPs platform. SNPs has since been acquired by Sonos, so the open source community and apps they were cultivating have been basically decimated, but before that happened, they sent me a board and I never really got around to playing with it. However, I did have an idea for an enclosure that would make for a great CNC experiment. Being a voice assistant though, the SNPs dev kit needed to be housed in an acoustically permeable enclosure. I went through a couple design iterations for this enclosure, and that's when I decided to take a cue from something that was right in front of me. My unibody MacBook uses laser drilled holes in the chassis over the speakers. The base material of my laptop itself becomes the speaker grill. I figured that might be an interesting technique to do in wood. So I mocked up a really simple body comprised of three layers. The first base layer would be the back of the shell of the enclosure, and it would have standoffs to mount the board. It would also have holes in the back to route power or accessory cables. 
The second layer would contain embedded magnets to secure a grille in the front. On this cover, I patterned up a ridiculous number of holes on the front face in Fusion 360, which crashed my computer several times in the process. Anything more than a couple hundred holes in Fusion is going to start causing some performance issues. A couple thousand is going to bring even the best computer to its knees. But with a lot of patience and at least 8 gigs of RAM dedicated solely to Fusion, you should be able to pull through it eventually. In the manufacturing workspace, I applied a drilling operation automatically to all the holes within a certain bounding box. To take advantage of symmetry, I only generated drilling toolpaths for a quarter of my speaker grill. Then I mirrored that toolpath twice to hit all four quadrants. Just to improve my odds of success with drilling, since a tool breakage partway through would be heartbreaking and time-consuming to recover from, I used pecking to retract the drill halfway through the cut and clear chips. The cycle time per hole would be less than 3 seconds. I exported my G-code and went to the garage to start machining my frames. I knocked out all the non-drilling stuff first since I wasn't worried about that, though I probably should have been. My toolpath off the bat was a little too aggressive and I knocked off one of my board standoffs. And then, on the contouring toolpath, I had an end mill slippage issue that caused me to miss a step and ruin the profile. But after ensuring my collet and end mill were clean, I tightened everything back up and changed my toolpaths to use a shallower depth of cut to impart less lateral force into the sidewalls of my features. And then, I loaded up my 0.9mm PCB drill and said a quick prayer to the machining gods. Taken individually, each hole really doesn't take very long, but cumulatively, this took several hours to machine. If you were doing this in a production environment, you would definitely want to do this with a laser. This drilling technique, however, ended up working great, and it produced a functional speaker grill that the SIPS microphone easily registered my voice through. The drilling toolpath with this PCB drill flew through over 8,000 holes without any issues. But, as luck would have it, weeks after finishing this project, SNPs was acquired by Sonos and announced that they would be shutting down the server-side console for developing and deploying third-party apps. So, I guess I'll probably be learning how to use this as a plain Raspberry Pi in the future. But the enclosure itself isn't the point. The experimentation and knowledge gained allowing me to make an informed decision about whether or not to use a drilling toolpath in a project is really what I care about. I could totally see this technique being useful for something like, I don't know, making a vacuum forming table? We'll see. In the meantime though, I want to thank you all very much for watching. I hope this video leaves you with a better idea about the suitability of drilling on a CNC router, the factors to consider, and the risks involved. I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.